Live from the files of the Stats Squad, you, yes you, are doing probability and statistics wrong. And that includes you, you computer scientists. Stick around. Well, now, it's a very bold claim to say you're doing it wrong, but let me tell you, fellow users of probability, statistics, and computer learning algorithms, physics and social science modelers, big data wranglers, philosophers of science, epistemologists, and other respected citizens, we are all doing it wrong. Not completely wrong, uh, not everywhere, and not all the time. But far more often, far more pervasively, and in far more areas than you could possibly imagine. What are we doing wrong? Well, uh, probability, statistics, causality, modeling, deciding, decision-making, communicating uncertainty. Everything to do with evidence. And I am going to prove that to you today, at least tease you with the proof because we'll never get to the full proof for that. uh, And this is nothing but a blatant and uh, advertisement for my upcoming book, uh, which there is a link for at the blog. The title of the book is Uncertainty, which is uh, half philosophy of science, half probability, half statistics, half computer science, half physics. It's all mixed in there. It's a philosophy of science. It's really an epistemological book about how to think about evidence uh, and how we're doing all this stuff wrong. Not everything is a mistake, though, and uh, from Naked Gun, we have this. Whoops, I didn't press the right button. This is, uh, this is live, everybody. And when you do that, this kind of thing can happen. Doctors say he's got a 50-50 chance of living. Well, there's only a 10% chance of that. Believe it or not, that uh, that works out. That probability works out if you were to figure out exactly uh, the lessons learned in this podcast. You could you could come back to a list of premises and evidence that will uh, support that statement. Now, look, if we're doing it wrong, we have to answer the questions: How, what, why, where, and when. Well, what? Pretty much everything. Everything to do with evidence. Where? Well, pretty much everywhere. When? Well, uh, every when, too. So that leaves two questions, the how and the why. I'll answer the why second. Let's talk about the how a little bit first. The big thing, the big problem, there are, there are several problems, but there are two main problems. And the first one in the how is everywhere the confusion between probability and decision. There are many methods out there from computer science to statistics, uh, hypothesis testing, uh, Bayes factors, all these things confuse decision with probability. There's even a, a theory of probability called the subjective theory of probability that looks like it's decision, that looks like probability flows from decision, but it's the other way around. The proof works in both directions, and I don't think that's generally recognized. And in any case, probability is not subjective, as we'll see. Now, the second thing, uh, the main problem, is the deadly sin of reification. And this manifests itself in statistics by the use, the extensive use the overwhelming use of parameters, infinitary parameters inside statistical models. These parameters are called effects. If you understand a model, and you must have some understanding to to follow this podcast, if you've ever seen a regression, the parameters inside that model are called effects. Well, they're always called effects. They are not effects. They have nothing to do with effects. This is the deadly sin of reification. Those parameters are parameters inside of a model. That's all they are. They are not effects. This is the main problem. Uh, We do not speak 
of reality. We speak of these parameters, these non-existent, fictional, infinitary parameters that that can't exist (laughs) physically, yet we speak of them as if they are the reality. And this leads to, when it's done right, which is sometimes... Uh, to gross approximations, reasonable approximations, good back-of-the-envelope stuff, even workable stuff. But a lot of the time, most of the time, and almost every time in some fields like sociology, psychology, educationism, uh, and, and the like, the, the, the really soft sciences, uh, what David Stove called the netherworld of the intelligentsia, these areas, it's always wrong. Because in those cases, the parameters are always mistaken for reality. And that's reification. And it's a deadly sin. And that leads to, as I claim often, (laughs) always, and every chance I get, there is pandemic over-certainty produced by these methods uh, married with scientism. And scientism, of course, is the belief that science is the answer to all questions. A self-refuting philosophy because scientism cannot answer its own justification. Uh, it's, it itself is not a, the justification for science as an answer to all things is itself not a scientific statement. But these sort of things never bother uh, psydolaters. We'll pass on to that. Now, parameters and decision. Parameters and decision. Parameters are in a model uh, usually, almost always, uh, infinitary, meaning that they're defined on the continuum, which is a special kind of infinity. Really, people don't understand what they're claiming when they're claiming they have knowledge of the continuum. I think that uh, infinity, the mistakes made when using infinity are enormous. Uh, The problem is this. Think about ordinary infinity, counting infinity, one, two, three, four, and so on, up to infinity. Well, that sounds like a nice thing. It sounds easy to do. But think about this. You have a Google, not the, the, the social justice warrior company, but the, the mathematical creation, which is 10 to the 100th power, which is a one with 100 zeros after it. That's a big number. That number is infinitely far away from counting infinity as the number 10. Well, all right, that's a big number, Uh, and we're trying to think about parameters, and you, again, uh, if you don't understand what parameters are, you will not follow this podcast. You have to have some basic level of understanding of statistical models, so look that up if you can't have it, or buy my book. It's in there. Now, parameters, infinity. So, we have the number one with 100 zeros after it. If we have a parameter defined on that, we're in good shape. If we say a parameter can take any one of those values from, uh, from say, 0 or 1 to 1 to 100 zeros after it, a Google, we're okay. That makes physical sense. Nothing, uh, there, there's nothing that big, uh, I think, anywhere that doesn't exist that amount of stuff. But it doesn't lead to any logical paradoxes, at least. Uh, we could think about having a parameter take any of those values. But again, this is a very small infinity. We have another infinity. Uh, We can take 10 to the Google, which is 10 to the one with 100 zeros after it, which is an enormous, unimaginable number. You can't think of it. You could write it down and conceive of its existence, but you can't develop a feel for it. It's impossible. Our brains are just not that big. Our minds, our intellects, I should say, it has nothing to do with uh, our, our physical representation, or very little. Now, this infinity is still, you know, this big number, this uh, Google Plex, as it's called, the 10 to the Google, is still infinitely far away from infinity. But it's still no logical paradox to say I could say a parameter could take any value from 1 to this Google Plex. Nothing wrong with that. There's no logical uh, paradox that creeps up by using it. No paradox in probability can de- be developed from it like it can using standard uh, infinitary methods. So we're still good. Now, you could take a Googleplex to the Googleplex. That is in- 
inconceivably large number, and we're still in counting infinity. And again, we though, if we stop at that number, which is far short of infinity, indeed it is infinitely far away from infinity, we have no paradox. We could imagine a parameter taking the value 1, 2, 3, all the way up to this Googleplex to the Googleplex, and so on. We could keep going like this. We could keep going all day long. We could keep going, baby. We could keep going forever, and we'd never get there. But there's still no paradox that creeps up as long as we let our parameter maintain a finite existence. But this notice what's happening here. I, the probability is, and I'm going to prove to you later, a matter of epistemology. It's a matter of our thinking. It's a matter of our knowledge only. It's not physically existent. It doesn't exist in reality. It only exists in our intellects. It is a, it idea. It is a relation between prop, uh, propositions. Relations do exist, uh, but they exist as forms. They exist as universals. They don't exist as physical things. And so, the the difficulty with these infinities are, just for the simplest infinity, the counting infinity, we have to be able to say that we have knowledge, knowledge, understanding that a parameter could take any value from one to infinity. That is claiming infinite knowledge. That is claiming infinite knowledge. That is a huge claim. Is it always unjustified to make this? I don't make that claim. I don't make that claim. It's, it's a very difficult and tricky subject, but I do say that most uses of infinity are just plain wrong. They're overblown. We cannot claim this kind of infinite knowledge for most problems. And the whole point of this harangue, and I haven't even nearly finished, is that this counting infinity, this trivial infinity, is just tiny. It's nothing. It's like a molecule of argon released into the entire atmosphere of the Earth. In fact, it's like an entire it's like a molecule of argon released into the solar system or the entire universe for that matter next to the infinity of the continuum. The infinity of the continuum is unimaginably inconceivably larger than the counting infinity. There's no way to even describe how large this infinity is. We could use symbols. But this is the problem. We use these symbols and figure we've got it all figured out because we could put it in symbolic form. Well, that's a lot of nonsense. We could figure out characteristics of the continuum. We could say it exists in a certain sense, and that's sort of indisputable. We could make statements about various properties of the continuum, and all these are well and good. But we cannot claim in any case to have the kind of super continuum infinite knowledge that a parameter inside all of these models can take specific values. Or if we can, it has to be in an enormously delicate, rare, odd, eccentric situation. Most of the time we're using these methods, these infinitary methods of the continuum, are in ordinary blasé things like normal distributions, like regressions like uh, chi-square tests and all these kinds of ordinary, everyday statistics. They're claiming infinite knowledge, not just a tiny counting infinity. People don't think about how big these infinities are because the symbols let you get away with not thinking about it. We've sort of gone the opposite of the reification. We've let the symbol fool us into thinking we have much more knowledge than we, than we really do. So the problem with these parameters is, even if we get past this, and this is just the tiniest hurdle. I spent way too long talking about this infinity business, far too long about talking about it. And I haven't talked about the real problem about parameters is that the deadly sin of reification is that all of the statements we make in statistics and probability are about these parameters, either as a Bayesian or a frequentist or sometimes as a computer scientist. We're talking about these parameters. We talk about estimation, estimating the effect size. This is false. This is wrong. This is reification to the extreme. None of these things are of the slightest interest. No parameter, because it's continuously infinite, can ever be observed. Therefore, we should only speak of observables. Now, there is a way to do this. 
There is an absolute way to do this. It's called a predictive approach. It's the same approach engineers use when building a bridge. An engineer makes a prediction. If I build this bridge using these materials and under these circumstances, cars will be able to drive over it without falling. Well, does it work? Physicists can make this kind of thing, saying if I build this electronic circuit under these conditions using these composites, it will transmit information in such and such a way. Does it? We can tell. We could make actual predictions and see if our models are conforming to reality. But with the way in Bayesian or frequentist statistics, and then the same way in machine learning and all these kinds of things, we don't make predictions. We speak of these parameters as if they were reality. And that's the problem. That's an enormous problem. That is a problem that just generates over-certainty faster than a bureaucrat creates new regulations. It's mind-boggling, the pace of this stuff. You cannot make a statement about a parameter and assume it has anything to do with reality or assume it has anything to do with the certainty you have in reality. Now, proving this is, a, is not that difficult. It's a mathematical proof in a way. Part, part uh, logical, part mathematical. And uh, those who have any experience with these types of models will understand what I'm talking about. But we need to change radically. We need to change to a predictive approach in all of science. And that's because of the why, which we'll get to. But before that, and I've already gone on too long, we need to talk about the other how part. The other how part is decision. Decision is when, in a hypothesis test, if you've heard of these things, a wee p-value tells you to reject a null hypothesis, or a large Bayes factor tells you essentially the same thing, to reject a hypothesis. This hypothesis is always that an infinitary parameter takes an impossible value, a value that can't be observed or measured. And so we're in the, the, the land of preposterosity immediately. But everybody even knows this, but people just go on because it's so easy for a piece of software to write and make decisions for you to remove the probability and uncertainty of things, to assume that cause, to assume that causation has been demonstrated, which is what really everybody wants. But no probability model ever demonstrates cause. No probability model can tell you about cause. Cause is information about a universal in a way. It's about powers. It's about <sighs> essences. It's about nature of, uh, of, of particular systems and so forth. And yesterday on the blog, and there's a link to the gambler's fallacy, which I prove that what's important is pure probability in a predictive sense and understanding of the nature or essence of a situation. These should be triumphant. These should be the way we're doing uh, everything, but we don't. We substitute instead these decision-making apparatuses for us because it's easy. Because it's easy to get a wee p-value or a large base factor and claim that you have found a cause, and it's absolute nonsense. The, I, I've had regular listeners and regular readers will know I've gone over hundreds and hundreds of paper over the past decade, papers over the past decades that purport to prove cause in something that uh, the only proof is uh, some statistical sample and wee p values. It's absolute nonsense. This whole area is just wrong. It's philosophically wrong. It's round, wrong from the ground up. And uh, I'd have to spend an entire podcast just describing that. But I've already gone on far, far too long about this. So we need to talk about we need to talk about the actual why of things. So why is all this wrong? There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. But, <laughs> excuse me, but is this an unknown unknown? I don't know. Now, here's the thing. So we did the how. Uh, the how is probability being replaced by decision or the conflation of probability and decision, the misunderstanding that probability is not decision, and the deadly sin of reification where parameters or the models themselves are mistaken for reality. 
or statements about models or statements about parameters are mistaken for statements about reality in which over certainty is vast, vast, uh, almost incalculably vast. Um, that's the how. Now the why. Well, uh, the problem is in how we think about probability itself and how we think about evidence. Now, probability is conditional. Probability does not exist. Probability is conditional on evidence, supposed, uh, argument, givens, uh, observations, anything you like to call premises, I like to say, and, and as in any logical argument. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. This is a good argument, a valid argument, a sound one. Logic is the study, not of these statements themselves, but of the relation between the statements. We have on one side a list of premises, which we can just say as the joint premise. On another side, some proposition of interest. In this case, Socrates is mortal. And logic studies the relation between those premises and this proposition of interest. The relation. Now, we can't have a statement in logic, and everybody recognizes this in logic, by itself, that we say is true by itself without reference to some premises. And that's perfectly obvious in logic. And it's the same in probability. It's this exact same in probability. We cannot have a probability uh, state. We can't have a probability of a proposition of interest without regard to some premises, without regard to some evidence. And once you have that under your belt, once you take that and understand that all probability is conditional, and it, everything else flows, all of the fixes to our, our solution, well, all, all the fixes to our problems, well, not all, I, this is, that's a grandiose claim. Uh, people will always find a way to screw up and be over certain and lie and cheat and manipulate and finagle and bamboozle and uh, just plain get it wrong. That, 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 not, nobody could fix that. But at least we could go a great way towards uh, calming or tempering the over-certainty that exists by understanding all probability is conditional. Well, open any book, any stats book, any probability book, introductory book, like a 101 book, and you'll find probability introduced in those books as if it were unconditional, as if probability existed, as if it was a real thing, as if it was a physical thing like mass or energy. And only later in those books do they bring in the notion that probability is conditional or could be conditional. But this is false. It's a false way to start. It gives the idea, then, that we can come up with probabilities of, well, parameters. We could put down, as Bayesian say, a prior on this <laughs> infinitely valued, infinite of the continuum valued parameter. And all kind of prop, uh, paradoxes crop up when you do that. And so frequentists are right when they claim Bayesians are nuts. Uh, when they use these kinds of things. And they are, because these things don't make sense. Because they don't have proper conditions. They don't have premises. They've assumed that these parameters are unconditional probabilities. And just such things do not exist. Every situation has premises. Every argument has a list of premises that are related to some proposition of interest. Now, that also takes some proof, uh, but I do so in, in the book that I have. And in any case, it's sort of obvious. Think of any probability, uh, prob probability like probability of a coin flip coming up heads. Well, you have a whole bunch of evidence there that's in your head. Even if it's not written down properly, it's still there. All right, well, you have a two-sided object. Just one side is an H, and when flipped, only one side can show. There we go. There's evidence for you. And so... All right, there's probability uh, we have with respect to some premises. You change those premises, and you change the probability of this thing coming up H. And it's quite obvious what's going on. And we come back to the we come back to the gambler's fallacy because somebody out there invariably will say, "What about a bent coin? What about a loaded coin, or an unfair coin, or a asymmetric coin?" Well, none of that makes the slightest difference. If you say, I have an asymmetric coin, two-sided, 
coin, asymmetric, just one side labeled H, which when flipped can only come up one side. The probability of an H is still a half. If you say it's a weighted coin, two-sided, just one side H, the probability is still a half. That premise is absolutely unrelated to the proposition of interest because it gives no information. It's not probative. Um, but you're thinking to yourself, what if I have a real coin? Ah, what if I have a real coin that's bent or unweighted or rather weighted in some fashion? Well, every coin is weighted in some fashion. Think about what you're saying when you're talking about symmetric coins. And the same criticism here or the same argument I'm about to give applies to absolutely everything. Think about what symmetry demands. This is an un People rarely think about what symmetry demands. Think about it. I'd have to have a precisely round object. Now, right away, we're in, in, in the land of impossibility because there are no precisely round objects. Because in order to defi uh, define a precisely round object, or to construct one, I should say, I would have to be able to construct objects on the continuum. Well, perhaps some string or m brain or something like this is precisely round in this way. Okay, perhaps. Let that slide. But a coin? No, you can't get a coin that way. Now, inside the coin itself, the material has to be absolutely uniform across the coin. Not a deviation of a single quark or an electron or anything that is out of kilter with the, the, the axes of sy symmetry. And of course, no real object is like that. Every object is swarming with, uh, with subatomic activity. So no object can ever be symmetric in a perfect sense. So when we're asking for symmetry, we're asking for a ton. And this is what needs to be understood. So that leads us back to the gambler's fallacy, again, which is necessary reading for this podcast. When we say there's a gambler's fallacy, you know, a gambler looks at the, uh, the, the roulette wheel and it's come up eight, nine, ten times red, and he says to himself, black is due, and he makes a bet on black, and we all laugh at him because that's preposterous. Ha, 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 the probability hasn't changed. Frequentists say that, Bayesians say that, computer scientists say that, uh, but the point of it is they can't say that. They can't say that using their theories. Their theories disallow them. The Bayesians would say, hey, this guy has a subjective opinion, therefore it's right. The frequentists would say, well, we have to spin the wheel an infinite number of times before we know. The computer scientist would start, or the physicist would start speaking of symmetries and so forth. No, we understand that the nature, or the essence of this wheel is to be a certain way. And it's because that it is a certain way that we are able to speak of it. That, or to speak of probabilities of propositions related to the nature to, to the object itself. Well, that's a lot to sort of swallow in one podcast. We didn't nearly get to everything. I'm going to have to redo this one carefully over a series. I'm I'm thinking about doing the entire book as a sort of a lecture series, and uh, that'll happen uh, perhaps later this summer when the book actually comes out. The book is coming out. The 31st of July, it's been moved up a little bit. I was told by my publisher yesterday they are going to uh, feature it at the joint statistical meetings, which are going to be held in Chicago this year. And uh, starting, I think, July 30th through August something or other, just a few or four, four or five days in Chicago. So my book will be featured there. And if you're a statistician who goes to these meetings or a probabilist, pick it up. Read it. I love to argue with you. Come to the blog anytime. That's it for this week. Uh, next week, something new. I had a bite to eat at Gino's down the street. And now this welcome sight. Glad to see you're born again. Atlantic City, my old friend. Be there when I bet on ten, I bet on you. Remember how they put you down?